Hello, I'm Bill O'Donnell and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, today we're in part two with a wonderful interview with Archbishop John C. Wester, the 12th Archbishop of the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, uh, and it's been just a pleasure to have you, Archbishop. Last Thank week we heard a lot of his childhood and growing up and what it was like to be a seminarian and ordained to the priesthood uh, all the way through, I think, the 70s was you were ordained? 76. Yeah. 76 trombones. That's right. It was Spirit of 76. That's yeah. great. Anyhow, and so we hope to get into a, a deeper uh, expression of his experience as a priest and a bishop and, and uh, how he feels about being here in Santa Fe. So welcome back, Archbishop. Thanks, Bill. Good That's to be great. back. Thanks, yeah. Bill. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be able to see this uh, part one if you missed it. Uh, hopefully it'll be on the internet and you'll be able to go back and look at it. I recommend you do that before we start here. But take us now back to that time after you were ordained, you're now a priest and let me just start off. What was it like the first time you laid your hands over the bread and the wine? Well, it was, uh, it was, it's really awesome. I mean, it's hard to put it into words, frankly, when you realize the intimacy you have there, that sacramental moment with Christ, uh, that down through the generations for 2,000 years, you know, you're participating in this beautiful, beautiful uh, Eucharist that is the source and summit of all we are as Catholics, you know, in our faith. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful gift, and, uh, and of course, it's, it's with the people of God. You know, that was the whole purpose of Sanctus Sanctum Concilium, that document on the liturgy in the Vatican II Council, that to have the full active conscious participation of the people around the one altar, and to see the people, the faith of the people at that moment, it's just, it's just, mm. it's, it's just their faith really energizes mine, and hopefully mine theirs, as we together come forth to express, you know, to celebrate the sacrament. So it's, it's a beautiful moment. And it's, of course, something that, uh, you know, what are the signs you see in sacristies? Uh, priest of God, say this Mass as if it was your first Mass, as if it were your last Mass, as if it were your only Mass. Because as human beings, we can become complacent. We get kind of uh, mm -hmm. careless, nonchalant. And when you're around the sacred mysteries, the beautiful Eucharist, you never want to be complacent. You always want to realize this is a great gift to be in God's very presence, the body and blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. I know in the seminary there's a priest, we had, he always take his watch off when he celebrate Mass because he said the Mass is timeless. Mm -hmm. and I think on a practical level, he didn't want to be distracted by meetings or classes he had after Mass. He said this is, it was a symbol for him that when I'm in the Mass, this is Kairos time, not Kronos time, uh, God's time. I just read about that. And then what do you remember about the first time uh, we're talking about the sacraments now the real blessing of being a catholic what about the first time you heard someone's confession and then you sped, said those words and i absolve you in the name of the father son mm. and Lord. what did that feel like well again very similar you know it's not a question of feeling of power it's a question of of gratitude to christ who makes himself so available to us through the sacraments yeah and a real, uh, the humility of it all, you know, that here's a person coming in. I don't remember, in those days, of course, the confessionals were mm -hmm. dark. You know, we had the, I'd sit in the middle and person on my left and on my right. We still have that, but it's basically a, a reconciliation room now. Mm -hmm. But, um, so I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't have seen the person. I didn't know who it was. And so there was that anonymity, which we still have for those who like that and want mm -hmm. that, and that's fine. Yeah. But, um, uh, but it, was the, it was still humbling that people would come in and that they would be sharing with you, in some cases, their deepest secrets, their sins, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that trust and that coming before God humbly and, and, and the beautiful metanoia, this change yeah. of heart. Yeah. It's a great grace. It's, it's really uh, inspirational. I miss that, you know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, as I get, my, get settled here in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, I've got to work on talking to Father Adam so I can I want to come up to Santa Fe on Saturdays and then leave on Monday's my day off and then maybe come back on Tuesday morning to the to Catholic Center on Tuesday morning. But, and of course it, it varies. But the point is, I'd love to get back to hearing confessions again. And it's a good thing, for, grounds me. You know, otherwise I'm just kind of an administrator, but it's good to really be grounded and hear confessions and 
-hmm. and it reminds me of, of my own need for forgiveness and, 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 and humility. And anyway, there's a beautiful expression. I know. I always talk about the second reconciliation because I, I went this morning before I came to Mass, uh, and I could feel that lightness of being. It's like I told this to Archbishop Sheehan uh, when he was on, and, and, and I says, I feel like I've taken a spiritual shower. Ah. And then he says, and, and then I have that extra zing when I go to communion. He says, oh, I couldn't agree with you more. You know what yeah, I mean? Because yeah. you know what I mean. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's, that's why I do this. I want to share those, those benefits yeah. to this. It's not about blind faith or obedience. It's about getting closer to God right. and feeling it inside you. And the sacramental grace, you know, we, we, it's so important. You have the grace of the sacrament. And again, it's hard to put into words, but you just know it's there. It's, uh, people sometimes will say to me, oh, well, I can get close to God by taking a walk up in Pecos Canyon or Chaco Canyon, and I'm close to God, and, and I don't have to go to Mass. And I say, well, I, first of all, I say, I agree with you. You're quite right. You can get very close to God in the natural revelation. But I said, it's not either or, it's both and. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, you can get close to God in Chaco Canyon, Pecos, whatever. You can get close to God at the Mass. But the Mass, that is a, an intensity of presence. I said, for example, if you have a married couple and they could write each other a letter, that's beautiful. Be very present to each other. You could talk to each other on the phone. One of them takes a business trip. There's a lot of ways of being present to each other. But when that trip is over and, you, and you, you come back together again and you walk hand in hand to take a little walk before dinner and you're holding hands, that's presence. That's a great presence. So, so this, it's, kind of, it's only an analogy, and analogies limp. But the point is, in the sacraments, Eucharist, reconciliation, whatever it may be, sacrament of the sick, baptism, confirmation, in the sacraments, there's an intensity of presence uh, uh, that, that, that is just... Um, like nothing else. And of course, there are other aspects of it. You have the communal aspect of it. The Catholic Church is communal. I had a friend of mine, a priest friend of mine one time, he was being poetic. He said, well, Jesus Christ is plural. Jesus is not private. He's plural. He invites all people together. In him and in him we are all one. And so I mentioned that to people too. On your walk, you can be close to God, but at the Eucharist, you're close to God and your brothers and sisters in those pews as you become one with each other through word and sacrament. And so there's wonderful benefits, you know, to, so to being part of the church. Sometimes I, I'm on the plane. Every, I was on a plane a while back, and they, they saw my collar, my sin-fighting suit, I call it. Sin-fighting suit, okay. And so they said to me, oh, well, you know, Father, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not, I'm not religious. And I said, oh, hi, I'm Father, I'm Archbishop. He said, I'm both. What do you mean? I said, well, I'm spiritual and religious. So it's nice you have one of them. That's good. I hope one day you can have both too. I don't put it that way, but the point is they act as if, well, it's either spiritual or religious. No, you can be both. Yeah. And you can certainly, there's always going to be, for any Catholic, there's always going to be that spiritual private prayer that's so sacred and important, but there's also going to be the communal prayer. And so that's what, we have both, you know, and, and so that's so important, I think, to our uh, the, the community, that you're part of a, a community of faith, praying together, praying for each other, the power of prayer to pray for each other. I had a surgery in 2009. I had prostate cancer, and so I went in for a prostatectomy at, at St. Salt Lake Regional. And, I can, Bill, it's hard to put this into words, but I had more people praying for me, my mother, of course, my family, friends, parishioners, parish, diocese. I even made the USA Today. I was on the plane... And I was reading, you know how they have the, every state? And it must have been an awfully slow news day because in, it said, Catholic bishop has prostate surgery. I go, wow, what, they put that in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the point is, I had all these prayers. Mm -hmm. And even, uh, God bless them, I got a call from a dear friend of mine who's uh, one of the elders of the Mormon church. He's one of the 12 apostles. And he said, would it be okay with you, uh, President Monson would like to put your name on an altar and pray for you before your surgery. I said, please, I'd be most grateful if you would do that, to pray for me. Mm -hmm. The power of prayer. And I cannot tell you how peaceful I felt before that surgery. I said, Lord, this mm -hmm. is p part of that, that prayer. It was almost like God was saying, okay, we're going to get him through the surgery, okay, but I'm also going to make you feel peaceful. And I'm sure he had to siphon a few off for other people that I don't even know about in that hospital because he said there were so many prayers that they did the trick and then he was 
kind of like, I don't know how to express this, banking them for other people, you know. Uh -huh. so, so what I'm trying to get at is the coming together in faith, that Eucharist, that prayer, uh, it's such a powerful thing. Uh, it's a wonderful grace to be part of the church. Uh, the church is instituted by Christ to give grace, obviously. The church is the expression of Christ, the presence of Christ in the world today, instituted by Christ so that we can have a tangible way of relating to Christ. So that it's not, uh, it, prayer is a great way to do it too, of course, that private prayer, but to have the sacraments and to have the people of God coming together uh, I really encourage people to th think, if, you, if, if you're away from the Catholic Church, if you think, well, it's, you know, I, I'm going to just do it on my own, think about the beauty of being part of a community. And sometimes people have a bad experience, say, with the priest or deacon or, heaven forbid, even a bishop. And they say, oh, you know, yeah, he yelled at me when I was a kid or, you know, he's grumpy or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I say to people, don't give him power over your faith life and you're being part of That's, you know... We're only human beings, and so we're, that's, that's the, the, the vulnerable side of our church. That's we're human beings. We're imperfect. We're sinners. But uh, don't let that person have that kind of power over you. Now, I, I think sometimes people are looking for an excuse, any excuse. But nonetheless, I think it's important to realize the beauty of the church and to be able to uh, not let any one event or any one inter interaction uh, you know, come between you and Christ and between the rest of that community. So I think, that's, I think that's what Pope Francis is really trying to get at, is to say, you know, the church is so beautiful and there's so much to it, it's so rich, that even if you've had, you know, a bad experience here, there are many, many wonderful experiences waiting for you. So I think that's an important message to Yeah, I'm glad you brought up Pope Francis, because uh, you're the first person I've met that's been appointed anywhere by Pope Francis. And have you met Pope Francis, and why do you think he chose you to take this job on? Uh, yes, I have met him, and uh, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm grateful to him. He's, a, I just, I'm, he's just a wonderful human being, such a great leader, such a great pope, humble, kind, generous, prayerful, holy. He's got all the ingredients in my book. He cares about people. And this is not something that's new since he was elected pope, because he did this uh, incredibly so in Buenos Aires, taking the, the bus and the subway down to the barrios and the, where the gangs are. One time a priest was on a hit list there because he had been preaching mm -hmm. for the people and, and, and actually preaching against the gangs and the drug pushers. And he was on a hit list. And the Pope, then you know, Archbishop, Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, walked in that barrio as if, to, walked up and down the streets as if to say, if you're going to kill one of my priests, you have to kill me first. A, a tremendous man, a great man. I've read several biographies. I'm still reading them. Uh, he's just a, a, a tremendous uh, leader, I think. And uh, we're very blessed to have him. So why do you pick me? Well, you know, there's a long system, a long process. Uh, they have the Congregation for Bishops, and then you've got the Nuncio here in the United States, and you've got the provinces. We're in the province of Santa Fe, so we meet regularly once a year to... Uh, every, so, every periodically we have what we call the De Promo Vendus meeting where we surface names of possible bishops. So there's a lot of different ways that a person becomes a bishop and then in which a person is uh, made a bishop of a given diocese. We, we call a diocesan bishop and so, uh, or an ordinary. So, um, you know, I, who, I don't know, frankly, that's one of the things about it is it's, it's done... Uh, for obvious reasons, it's not done publicly because people have to get someone that's good and you don't want to, it's not a, uh, in a popularity contest, right. it's not something you run for, you, you, you try out for it. That's right. It's something that they say, Holy Father, we believe that here are three names, they call it a turner, these are three names we believe would be uh, good for this diocese and they're in order of preference. And sometimes the Pope will say, great, you know, I'll take the top ones. I know from what people are telling me, the Pope has said, no, go back and do it again. I don't, you know, I'm looking for someone different. This Pope, Pope Francis, has made it very clear that he wants uh, bishops to really serve the people of God. He wants them to be pastoral. He wants them to, to, to have the smell of the sheep, as he puts it to lead from the front, from the middle, and from behind. Uh, it's not a career move. It's not a climbing up a ladder, you know. It's, 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 it's meant, rather, that you're there to serve. And so that he's made it very clear to the nuncios around the world that's what he wants. 
And so you'll notice, for example, uh, in the last go around, um, uh, you had three of our bishops who made cardinals that were not. Now, uh, Kevin uh, was made, he, he was sent to Rome to be in the congregation, so that was a natural. Kevin is who? Uh, he was the Archbishop, he was the Bishop of Dallas. Okay. And so uh, he, the Bishop of Dallas, now he's in, and, and I forget his congregation, but uh, it's with laity, I believe. And he's a wonderful, wonderful man. He, he was an excellent choice, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, but then, of course, uh, Archbishop Tobin and Archbishop Supic. Archbishop Supic, the Archbishop of Chicago, and, and Tobin, the Archbishop now of Newark. Um, they uh, were uh, Now, we would expect Archbishop Supic because he's in Chicago. But Archbishop Tobin, that was not, he was in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. I believe when he got the news, then was transferred uh, to Newark. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, that was not in the ordinary course of things. Uh -huh. And so this is a message from the Pope that uh -huh. he's looking for. And Archbishop told both of, all three of those men are tremendous, tremendous leaders, humble, yeah. gifted, good, good men. So uh, you know, I mean, I think that this Pope is really trying to go away from this um, kind of uh, more of a, what would I say, uh, career kind of a thing to more of a pastoral mm -hmm. service oriented oh, movement. Great. Let's go back for a moment to your, you're just a, a regular priest in San Francisco and then all of a sudden you start giving more assignments and then you become an auxiliary bishop. What was that like to be in your own home area and then to be so almost like kicked upstairs, shall we say? Well, it's a, it's a shock, to be honest with you. It's, it's just not, a, I just never expected it. I had no idea. I just, it was a shock. I was, I got the call. That I had the 8 o'clock mass at St. Peter's Parish in Pacifica. And um, I, um, uh, it was 10 to 8 when the nuncio called. Archbishop uh, uh, Leveda called me. He said, okay, you don't want to know if I was going to be there. I said, why is he so curious if I'm going to be here? I said, yeah, I'm going to be here Friday morning. It was the feast day of the Sacred Heart in June, the, the movable feast. Uh -huh. And it was that Friday, you know. And um, so I took the phone and the nuncio told me, you know, the Holy Father would like you to be the Holy Bishop in San Francisco. Well, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I said, oh my goodness. Who was your predecessor? Was, uh, there, was there an auxiliary well, before? Well, auxiliaries don't have predecessors. Well, I do, they do. I mean, they do. Yeah, there was uh, Bishop McGraw uh, was uh -huh. my predecessor, the now Bishop of San Jose. Okay. And uh, so he would he would have been okay. the predecessor. And he was a San Francisco man too. Oh yeah, good okay. man. He's born in Ireland, but he's oh. a wonderful bishop. Okay. And um, so um, so anyway, I, I so then I <laughs> go say the clock mass after getting this bombshell, <laughs> and my knees were knocking, and I'm shaking like. How old were you at that time? I was forty-seven. Okay. So uh, so I was kind of um, uh, you know obviously just in shock. And of course, you can't tell anybody. It's a papal secret. Although we joke about, you know, a papal secret is something you don't tell the Pope. But I mean, <laughs> but it was a papal secret, so um, uh, you can't sell souls. So I did the mass. Then I was getting in the car to drive up to Reading to do a wedding for these dear friends of mine. And um, so I got up to the to the wedding rehearsal, and one of the priests was also a friend of this family. He was going to celebrate, so he came up Saturday to celebrate the wedding. And he came up into the sacristy and he said, "Hi, John." And he said, "How you doing?" I said, "Oh, fine." He said, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. Why? I'm just fine. Everything's fine. He said, I don't know. You look like someone said you're going to be a bishop or something. <laughs> well, I must have turned bright red because you have to keep the secret. I said, oh, well, is that right? <laughs> so much, much later after the ordination, I said to this priest, Tom Perini, a wonderful priest, I yeah. said, what ever possessed you to ask me that question? He said, I don't know. I just uh, said it. You know, he had no clue because he wouldn't have a clue. Uh -huh. Anyway, so, uh -huh. yeah, it was a shock, but, uh -huh. you know, God gives you the grace. I think we used to call it actual grace in theology. It's the grace of office, and God, mm -hmm. you know, helps you. And, and you know, this, we make each other look good. You know, there, nobody is, you, I wasn't asked to be a bishop because of, I, of anything I have. It's just, you know, it's all God's grace working in you, the people that you work with, your people, and, you know, your brother priests, brother yeah. bishops, the lay leaders, deacons, religious Everybody working together. Uh, we all have something to do, and uh, so it, it's it's not any great shakes in that sense. It's just a yeah. question of being part of the of the uh, of the of the service of the church. But it does put you in a different position in a way. I mean, your friends are friends; they're going to be friends anyhow. But now, from now on, it's 
it, it's like you, you ordained, and now you're a priest, now you're a bishop, yeah. this sort of thing. You yeah, know? It is, it, it's a different, you know, a bishop is yeah. a position of leadership, and it's more, uh, you know, they say when you become a bishop, there are two things you'll discover. One is that you'll never have a bad meal again, and the other is that you'll never hear the truth again. <laughs> now, that's, of course, perhaps a little <laughs> jaded, but I think, you know, I guess what they're getting at is that, you know, it is, there is that element sometimes of loneliness or, mm. you know, being apart in one sense. Sure. Uh, there is certainly a, a fraternity uh, among the priests that I really treasure and I think is wonderful. But uh, as bishop, it's it's harder to have that, you yeah. know. Although I had I had a, I was in a Jesu Caritas group as bishop and as auxiliary. It was a wonderful group, and uh, there, no one ever in the group, you know, it was just we were mm -hmm. just brothers. There was okay. no. Yeah. Now, in the few minutes we have left, drive us to Salt Lake City. You've been in San Francisco, and now you're been given that job as the Salt Lake City was a wonderful. Uh, they have a new bishop now as we're taping this. Uh, bishop Oscar Solis. Auxiliary in Los Angeles will be the new, uh, he'll be the 10th uh, Bishop of Salt Lake City. Uh, he's a wonderful man, he'll do a great job there, and he's going to be Bishop of a wonderful church. It's a beautiful, beautiful diocese, beautiful people, um, they're wonderful. The Catholics there have a passion about the faith. Uh, they, of course, it's the headquarters for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they're wonderful people, very uh, giving and faithful people. Uh, a lot of other religious, uh, strong religious uh, religions represented there in Utah, equally wonderful. So it, it's just a great place. It's a beautiful place. That it, it, it's just uh, Utah, yeah. I think, is one of the best kept secrets in the United States. It's a great. I know you ski, Bill. You, I, I don't know if you go to Park City or Deer Valley, once. but yeah. I'm not a skier, but they tell me the powder there is marvelous. So uh, it's, anyway. No one will disagree with you. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think so. It's a great place. Uh, no, I think I loved my eight years there. I. I kind of uh, learned a lot. There's wonderful people there. Monsignor Fitzgerald, Monsignor Berkhamshaw were the two vicar generals I had, and they served the diocese beautifully. They served me mm -hmm. with great devotion and love and humility, and they're just, all the pastors there, wonderful. it's just a mm -hmm. great uh, place. I just can't mm -hmm. say enough about it. Did you get it. to travel much around that beautiful oh, state? Oh, yeah, 85,000 square miles. <laughs> yeah, I lost 20,000 square miles when I came here. <laughs> we <laughs> had, uh, uh, the whole state is a diocese. Uh -huh. Here we have 65, roughly 65,000 square miles mm -hmm. in, in the Archdiocese of Santa Fe. Uh, so, but you know, the people are concentrated within the, um, the Wasatch Front. So 80% yeah. of the Catholics were within an hour and a half or so. so. Okay, so now you're here. And you've been very well received. I've been to a lot of those events where you were brought in and the rest of it. And I'd never seen so many, so much hierarchy in the St. Francis Cathedral Basilica when you were invested with the job. It was, yeah, uh, it was a beautiful investiture. The, the people here in Santa Fe the Archdiocese are marvelous as well. I just love the history, the Catholicity. The people are so proud, of, and they should be, of their heritage here in New Mexico. Uh, I just love the... Um, the atmosphere, it is an enchanted place. It's, it's, it, it was an adjustment. It's different than Utah, different than San Francisco. It's obviously, it's a desert. This is more, Utah is a high desert also. Mm -hmm. But here I, you feel more like I'm in a desert. You know, I can, I, I can sense the, and I've always found the desert very mystical, very beautiful. You know, Jesus went in the desert to pray. Mm -hmm. and, and we bishops of Region 13 make our retreat down in Tucson at the Redemptorist mm -hmm. place. And that's a different kind of desert again, you know, sure. a lower desert. But it's just a beautiful uh, although Tucson's higher than Phoenix. But anyway, it's a beautiful uh, place. The people are wonderful. The church is very rich, the penitentes and, the, mm -hmm. and all the, uh, the pueblos and mm -hmm. the, the history, Santa Fe, Santa Fe Trail, Pecos Trail. I mean, I'm just, I've got so much to do. I've got to read and read and read about all the history here, you know. So. But I did, I did read Death Comes for the Archbishop. I had to read, yeah, read that. That was That's required Reguera. reading. That was required. Yeah. So I read that right away. Yeah. And uh, what else have you read? Have you read Milagro Beanfield? What are they talking I've got, about? I've got that. Okay. I'm reading Paul Horgan's book oh, right yeah. now. Lamy. about Lamy. Lamy. Yeah. And uh, I'm yeah. also reading Sister Blandina's book, Santa F End of the Santa Fe Trail. Yeah. And so uh, in addition to, you know, but that's my New, New Mexico. You know, I just found out today is a beautiful image that the New Mexico, uh, the state coat of arms has the, uh, I did not realize this until just this day, that it has the American Eagle, in the, representing the United States, but then there's the Mexican eagle under the wing there. There's this mm -hmm. kind of this mm -hmm. unity. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, beautiful expression of the coming together of the cultures that I've noticed in New Mexico. 
the European, you know, the Spanish, the Latino, the Native Americans, other European, all the other people that have come here. Uh, there's been a lot of, of, of mixing of the cultures here. And that's you know, the, the cuisine, the landscape, everything kind of typifies that place where a kind of a, a, a meeting ground. And mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful image for New Mexico, you know, a welcoming place. You know? I do too. And I, I'll confess to you that I got my faith, adult faith here. I mean, the, 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 it's not lost to me that it's a city of holy faith. Yeah. In the blood of Christ Mountains. And the blood of Christ Mountains, that's right, exactly. Yeah, that's, it's, it just... It just we're imbued with it, yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's in it's in the culture, it's yeah. in the people. I I caught it from yeah. pews away. Just mm -hmm. you could feel this this faith. Well, and that through. the land there's a sacred. Yeah. Now we get a lot of that from our Native American brothers and sisters, of course. That the sacredness of the land. Mm -hmm. Pope Francis's you know Laudato Si encyclical about the the in, in appreciating the environment. Uh, I think resonates here really beautifully because of that. You know, mm -hmm. there's really a sense of the land is sacred, and and we hold that and. And I think that's, and when they did the Eagle Dancers at my installation at the cathedral in Santa Fe in June of 2015, you know, the, the look on those young men's faces, they weren't just, they were not just performing a dance, they were praying. Mm -hmm. And you could see that this was something sacred to them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's yeah. in the air here in New Mexico. And I can remember once, you can ask uh, Monsignor Jerome on this, but when he was the chancellor, he arranged for the Holy Father, uh, St. John Paul the Great, flying over to, to Arizona, I heard it myself at like 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Said, People of New Mexico, you know, this is the cradle of Christianity. The Franciscans brought it in here in the 1500s before the pilgrims even landed on Plymouth Rock. Well, that's why we, you know, sometimes we have little, uh, and my brother bishops and I have little friendly debates, you know. Uh -huh. I remember one time one of the archbishops said, well, you know, my diocese, archdiocese has it. So I poked the one next to me. I says, because and then the, the archbishop two down from me responding to that said no no my archdiocese does so I elbowed the bishop I said you tell archbishop it's it's Santa Fe <laughs> all they're both wrong we've got the we've got the goods yeah. on that so we yeah. don't push it though right. we let them have what they have so. Right. so one last moment what else have you learned about being here what would you like to share with the people at home in the few minutes we've got left well you know I've I've learned a lot I have a lot more to learn you know I but I think is that. Uh, one of the things I would say is the um, the importance of working together, coming together, and and helping. You know, I've I've learned that New Mexico is a very poor state. I did not know that, to be honest. And so I've I realize now that we have a lot of poverty here. About eighty percent of our kids are, on, are are Medicaid eligible. And so we've got a lot of work to do here. You know, we come in like forty ninth and fiftieth on so many areas, education for our children and and early childhood development and, and, and nourishment, et cetera. So I, I've learned that we have to come together because I also have learned that people in New Mexico have good hearts. They care about each other. We care about each other. And so I think that that care plus the realities and challenges we face coming together brings me hope, that we're a people of hope, that we have a lot we can do, but we have to come together to do it. We can't be off on our individual agendas. We have to come together and listen and do what we can for the common good, which is a very important part of Catholic social teaching, mm -hmm. you know, the common good. So I think that's something that I'm, I'm eager to join my fellow New Mexicans in, in working together to solve some of these challenges, which are we're going to solve. I have no doubt about that. It's going to happen. I hope so. Well, thank you. At that note, I'm forward, we have to leave it. But it's been a blessing to have you, Archbishop. I hope you'll come back again any time with any time you, you have the opportunity to share with these people. I'd love to do I'll it. I'd be honored you. to do it, Bill, and thank you very much. Okay, it's been my privilege to have Archbishop Wester with us. I hope it's been of some value to you. Uh, please contact him uh, at the Archdiocese. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. If anything he said inspired you, I know he'd love to hear it. So on behalf of everybody here, our director, George, our camera people, Casey and Wendy, and our associate director, Mike Speck, here, if, uh, I want to thank you all for viewing, and stay tuned next week in another program on Spirituality.